Good morning. Um, I'm Kirsten Powers. I'm a political analyst at Fox News. Uh, if you watch Fox News, I'm the one always fighting with Bill O'Reilly. Um, and I also write a column for USA Today and um, something called The Daily Beast. And one of my issues um, of interest is religious persecution. I originally got interested in it uh, from Jeffrey Goldberg, who is a well-known journalist uh, who's an expert on the Middle East. And I was at a conference and he was talking about, um, he just sort of as a side said, you know, I, there's this horrific persecution going on in the Middle East and I'm just sort of shocked that we never hear about it. Um, we don't really hear, um, he, said, I, he said, I feel like if this was happening to Jewish people, all the Jewish people would be in the streets. I don't understand why Christians aren't, um, you know, writing to newspapers insisting that they cover it. I don't know why they aren't uh, out in front of embassies. And so I started to really look into it and I became quite interested in it. And I have written many columns on it. I'm sorry. Is my mic not on? Oh, okay. So sorry about that. Does everybody have? You guys should know that too. Um, so at any rate, I'm so honored to be here uh, and to be able to have a conversation with three amazing scholars of religious persecution. And um, with this, I'm just going to, you all have in your packets their full bios. So I'm just going to give you a brief introduction. Um, we have Marie, do I'm saying Marie? Is that correctly? Marie Tadros, who's a research fellow at the Institute of Development Studies at the University of Sussex, and she is a political scientist specializing in the politics and human development of the Middle East with a focus on democratization, Islamist politics, gender, sectarianism, human security, and religion and development. That's a lot. <laughs> um, and then we also have Todd Johnson, who's the director and associate professor of global Christianity at the Center for the Study of Global Christianity at Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary. And Todd is the world's leading expert on religious demography in general and Christian demography in particular. And then we have Paul Mar Marshall, who is a senior fellow at the Center for Religious Freedom at the Hudson Institute. And he is among the world's leading scholars of religious freedom. He's played a pivotal role in directing the world's attention to the modern crisis of Christian persecution. Um, so I think we're going to try to have as much of a free-flowing conversation as we can have. Um, and then at the end, we'll be able to have hopefully about 15 minutes to take questions from the audience. Um, and so Todd, I wanted to start with you and just ask um, if you could just give us sort of the big picture on how extensive the persecution of Christians is in the world today. OK, you'll, you'll see in your booklet that um, the estimate that came out after all of the different calculations that we did uh, was that 500 million out of about, out of about 2.3 billion Christians are living in countries where they're likely to be persecuted. And we'll add a little bit to that uh, in a few minutes. Uh, one surprising thing is that this number is currently on the rise. And uh, we're projecting that it will be about 600 million uh, by 2020, which is approaching a, a quarter of all Christians in the world at that time. So uh, I'll put that in context in just a minute. Uh, maybe I should say it's, it's a fairly simple calculation in one sense. Uh, it, you know, it's a combination of figuring out where Christians live and then using a taxonomy of countries in which they're likely to be persecuted, uh, which comes from my distinguished colleague, Paul Marshall here, and he'll talk, I think, more about what's involved in this, but we partnered together to uh, come up with this. It's actually 46 countries uh, in, that I utilized in my paper. You'll see that. Maybe I could uh, talk about three different shifts that are a bit unexpected in this if we back up from the current picture to what has happened over, let's say, even the last 100 years. and. Uh, one of the shifts is, is the most important shift, perhaps, in global Christianity, which is the shift of the center of gravity of Christianity from the north to the south, using sort of a UN designation there. But even geographically speaking, um, I'm sure you're all well aware of the fact 80% of all Christians were from Europe and North America in 1910. And that was uh, down below 40% by 2010. So it's a massive shift, and 
It's a combination of two things, basically. One is the decline of Christianity in the North that we're all familiar with, and then the, the uh, simultaneous rise of Christianity in Africa and Asia, a continued rise in, let's say, in Latin America through uh, births in particular. Um, but what's interesting for, for us today is that this shift um, is, is the, it, this, the same dynamics in this shift are happening in persecution. And in fact, um, today, uh, if you live in the global south, you're far more likely to be persecuted than if you live in the global north. And, and uh, that's interesting because um, over the last uh, hundred years, there's also been a shift in who's doing the persecuting, where it's happening. And uh, 100 years ago, or even le or slightly less, um, the uh, major uh, persecutors were fascists and communists, you know, the 20th century. And uh, the people under persecution within Christianity were mainly Orthodox, Catholic, some Protestant. And now, with the shift to the South, those communities are still under persecution. There's no doubt about it. but. But the fastest growing parts of Christianity, which would be Pentecostal, independent churches like the African independent churches, Chinese house churches we'll hear about later, they're now under, under the, the most uh, persecution. So you have a shift from north to south from maybe more traditional forms of Christianity to less. And then a third shift is from state-based persecution to society-based. And again, with the fascist and communist persecution in the 20th century, now it's much more diffuse. Uh, one person in a, in a village in the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, after, a, after a rebel army came in and killed a lot of Christians there, said, we don't know who killed us or why, and that's part of our grief. So this is very different than being uh, under uh, a, a government where it's pretty clear that it's that you're you're not you don't have the freedom to worship and that sort of a thing, uh, and persecutors today uh, represent a much wider variety of people and reasons and all of that sort of a thing. I could just say that from the demographic side, uh, Paul Marshall's taxonomy of uh, communist states, national security states, South Asian uh, religious nationalist states, and Muslim majority states. Um, that uh, what, what, uh, what we have, as far as the findings go here, of those 500 million Christians is that about 25% are in, that communist, in those communist states, about 40% in the national security states, or about 12% in South Asian religious nationalist states, and 25% in Muslim majority states. Um, so it's pretty spread out across all of these categories. That adds up to 102%. You have to look at the paper if you want the exact figures, but it gives you some indication. Paul also added uh, Western secular states, and we can maybe look at that a little bit later. So I think in, just in summary, the, the, there's been uh, quite a shift of persecution from the 20th century into the 21st, uh, surprisingly still robust. You know, at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, there were statements, you know, of, of pretty great optimism about a Christian century, which uh, uh, Robert Conquest called the 20th century the ravage century, so it wasn't quite as planned. And I think the 21st century looks a, a little um, dicey at this point as well. Um, so just to reiterate, um, uh, perhaps, again, the most interesting thing is that persecution is happening in places where Christianity is growing the fastest. All Christian communities, all 41,000 denominations in Christianity are under some um, persecution, but it's uh, independents in particular that, uh, that have uh, seen a, a great rise, even since 1970, 12% uh, of their community lived in these 46 countries, and today 36% of their community lives there. So this is a big change, and perhaps we can say more about it 
in a few minutes. Thank right. you. Thank you. Um, Paul, I thought it would be helpful, since we're talking about religious persecution, to just maybe quickly define what you consider religious persecution. Um, and then if you could talk about what you think the main causes are of anti-Christian persecution around the world. Okay. Um, uh, by religious persecution, uh, by religious persecution, I would, uh, a full definition would be, be quite yeah. long. Um, but uh, the denial of a person, um, firstly, uh, the right to worship, uh, secondly, to follow um, peculiar requirements of their faith in terms of dress or food, diet, and so forth. Um, thirdly, the, uh, the denial of the right of religious institutions to self-government, that is, to be able to choose your own leaders and the criteria of your faith. And fourthly, the um, denial of the ability of believers to live out their faith in their life in society. And it's particularly that last one where uh, many of the problems arise. Okay. In, in terms of um, looking at Christians in particular, um, what's happening and why, as, as Todd mentioned, I would, well, firstly I should say, I, I'm, I'm gonna summarize a world in eight minutes so there will be very broad generalizations, and we can obviously find exceptions. But um, five dominant groups of persecutors. One, the remaining communist countries, or the countries which call themselves communist. Uh, China, Vietnam, Laos, Cuba, North Korea. North Korea probably being the worst in the world. Uh, you then have a group of authoritarian states which are less ideological. These include the, the post-communist states. They're called post-communist, but not much has changed, particularly if you look at Belarus, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, the other stands, uh, together with regimes such as uh, Burma, which is changing, um, Eritrea, which is very, very bad, and Ethiopia. You have authoritarian states um, which want to repress any alternative source of allegiance or power within the country and um, engage in repression of, of very many groups, as do all of, of, of these. Um, but Christians are particular focused because of the very strong Christian assertion of the independence of the church. I'll get back to that. Uh, you then have religious nationalism in South Asia, India, Sri Lanka, um, uh, Nepal, Bhutan, whereby you get um, Hindu and Buddhist movements, a minority, I stress, um, but of a very reactionary form which identify the country, the state they're in, with the particular religion. So minority religions are looked at as foreign and are uh, sub subject to persecution. This is usually societal persecution. Not usually the government, but people around you, whereas in the first two categories, communist and authoritarian, it's the state that does it. So a lot, a lot of violence in South Asia on uh, religious grounds. A, um, a fourth category is radical Islam. This doesn't affect, as Todd said, this doesn't affect the most Christians, but it's the most widespread in, in the sense it occurs in the most countries. Um, and ominously, this is the one which tends to be growing. And we're seeing this, and we'll return to this in the conference, particularly in, in the Middle East, where you know, everybody is suffering now in warfare. But if you look at um, the Christians and other uh, minorities, Mandaeans, Yazidis, and so on, generally don't have militias. So they tend to be targets of everybody. And if you count the percentage of Christians amongst the refugees, it's disproportionately high. As you know, most of the Christian population of Iraq has fled the country in the last 10 years. The, uh, the final category, and this is the first time I've ever included it, is uh, Western, forms of Western secularism. Um, earlier, when people wanted to include it, I said, yeah, we have problems here, but compared to what's going on in the rest of the world, I wouldn't put it in the same category. I still wouldn't. Um, but there are ominous trends in the West. The Pew Forum on Religion and Public Life, in measuring 
a religious animosity or animosity towards the religious other, um, finds levels now in Europe, including Western Europe, as high as those in the Middle East. So I, I flag this because there are worrying trends. So that's sort of five broad patterns. Why, uh, why the persecution of Christians? Um, difficult to answer, but again, vastly oversimplifying three reasons. One is Christians are often accused of being foreign. Christianity is, amongst other things, a missionary religion, an evangelizing religion. So it spreads. It's a minority in many countries. And so accused in very many settings of being foreign. It's even in countries such as China, where you know, Christianity has a history of about one and a half thousand years. I, I, I do remember somewhat ironically watching Communist Party speakers standing on a podium and behind them were uh, large portraits of Marx, Engels, Lenin, and Stalin denouncing Christianity as a foreign influence. <laughs> so they had two Germans and two Russians up there and they say, as we know, there are Christian monuments in China from the 6th and 7th century. So this image of Christianity as foreign or sometimes as Western, that's one factor. Connected with it is the question of conversion. That Christianity calls people, um, when properly done, uh, always with integrity and honor, uh, to follow Jesus. And millions of people heed that call. So um, the idea of conversion is very threatening to traditional patterns and traditional ways. It is, here I'm um, channeling Peter Berger, the sociologist, um, that in a traditional society, you know, what you are is what you were born to a large degree. You, you, were, you live in the same place as your parents. You have the same religion as your parents. You follow the same job as your parents. So that is a given when, you, when you're born. And then someone says, you could be born again. That is, that also means that these traditional patterns need not follow. So it can be a disruptive influence. That's the second reason for, for uh, persecution overlaps with the first, the foreign one. And the third, and I'd emphasize most strongly given the theme of this conference, is the, associate, the present association, I will not speak of the past, the present association of Christianity and freedom. That ties in with the first two. But one of the things about Christianity um, is its assertion, uh, an important factor, I think, in the growth of democracy, is an assertion of the independence of the church. That could be done self selfishly. It could be done short-sightedly. But that mere confession says that the state is not the only authority. It is not the all-encompassing authority. There are areas of life which have a separate source of authority and a separate source of freedom. And if I um, may quote from the, the late uh, political uh, historian of political thought, um, George Sabine, who said, the rise of the Christian church as a distinct institution entitled to govern the spiritual affairs of humankind in independence of the state may not unreasonably be regarded, be regarded as the most significant event in the history of Western Europe in terms of actual politics and in political thought. Um, I actually got that quote originally, and he's smiling, from David Little's excellent book, Religion, Order, and Law. I subsequently read Sabine as a doctoral student, and I would have missed the quote because it was very hard to stay awake reading Sabine. <laughs> but um, that assertion of independence denies a sort of unitary society, a totalistic society. And this is a significant feature of Christianity around the world right now. So, Ideologies which are monistic, as far different as communism or radical um, Islam, or some forms, I emphasize some forms, of modern secularism, uh, believe that uh, the, the society sh should be unified by the state with one common source of authority and one common pattern. And Christians of whatever kind, even if they can't articulate the idea, uh, may instinctively resist that. 
uh, to maintain an independence of the church, but thereby asserting limits on the state, even if they're not aware of it. So I think the association of Christianity and freedom is one of the major factors in persecution. Well done, well done. <laughs> um, so, Marie, we've gotten the sort of global view, and it'd be great to just narrow in on an area that we've heard a lot about. Um, the Middle East has been in the headlines, of course, because of the Arab Spring, and if you could just sort of bring us up to date on what life is like for Christians mm -hmm. there today. Kirsten, I'd like to actually pick up where you left off on mm -hmm. the point of that there it has been an omission of what is happening in the Middle East, and I believe this omission is on purpose, that uh, many of the progressive forces, people who believe in rights, do not want to be critical of radical Islamist groups because the word Islam is in there. So they don't want to be seeming as being critical of another religion. And even when hundreds of thousands of Muslims rise and they say, these people do not represent us, we have a different, uh, um, we have different aspirations of what kind of society we want to live in, their voices are muted, and these radical Islamists are made to represent the people, simply because we don't want to come to terms with the fact that they do not necessarily represent what the people, and the, and the fact that we have had the largest ever revolt in the Middle East in hundreds of years, in Egypt, in June 2013, which was misrepresented as a coup, um, was, was, was testament to the fact that people don't necessarily want to listen to what is happening on the ground. So uh, today I want to very quickly focus on things of the seen and unseen, patterns of discrimination and encroachment, which we don't get to hear about, which are happening on a daily basis, and often these patterns are not just seen in the Middle East, but in many countries around the world. Um, I'd also like to, to also emphasize that sometimes it's not just Christians who are suffering from these forms of encroachments. A lot of other minorities are, um, and of course, because we are tight on time, we can't historicize and contextualize enough but, but I will try to touch on some of the patterns that are important for us to capture. Um, I want to also emphasize that now it's not just a question with this upheaval, with this reconfiguration of an entire region, um, this questioning of what kind of re-imaging, what kind of reimagining of a political and social order we want. Um, what is at risk is not just uh, a question of a group of people being discriminated on the basis of, the, of their religion. But I think there is a question of what is going to happen to the diversity, religious and political and social diversity, of the entire region if the current pattern persists. Um, there's also, um, touching on the, on, on the point about demography, there is a serious demographic threat. We talked about Christians being about 20% of the Middle East uh, around about the early 20th century. They have gone down to 10%. There's a risk they will go down to less than 5% by 2020. Now, of course, this is complex because it's driven by three factors, by the fact that Christians have lower birth rate, by the fact that Christians sometimes immigrate for economic reasons, for the search of a better life, but also they do, they have left the region because of persecution and discrimination and a sense of not having a place of their own or being welcome as equal citizens anymore. Um, so, in terms of political exclusion, I think that there are different facets, different patterns of uh, exclusion in politics that we see on a macro and micro level. Um, I think the greatest threat to political representation of citizens who happen to be Christians in the Middle East comes from Islamist ideology. Uh, an ideology that does not necessarily believe in equal citizenship. There is an official discourse that yes, of course, everyone is welcome, but when it comes to uh, the, the nitty gritty, uh, citizenship is mediated by your religious affiliation, as we saw in Egypt under the former President Morsi, and what we saw was a regime that was based on Islamist ideology being given the golden opportunity to show that it can actually be inclusive, and it failed the test. And part of the reason was that the ideology itself does not accept the fact that citizens will be equal irrespective of their religious affiliation and even if they have no religion at all. Um, the second thing is because there has been um, a deepening of um, intolerance on a community level, it is very difficult now for Christians to put themselves forward in Muslim majority electoral districts and be and come to office. Uh, there, there's always a counter propaganda of uh, you cannot vote 
uh, uh, an infidel into office. So unless you actually have quotas and forms of affirmative action, and you also have party proportional lists in the electoral systems in order for parties to put forward election, uh, Christians, it is going to be very difficult to have uh, any substantial political representation. The other issue which I think is extremely serious and will become more so in the upcoming years is that in, in the Middle East, the fear barrier has been broken. People have gone down to the streets over and over again, not trying to uh, exercise their citizenship rights. In cases where Christians have gone out against Islamist political parties and they have said, no, we don't want you in office, they have been uh, the subject of extreme forms of punishment. A very, very practical last example is 14th of August. Now, in terms of the media, World media, global media, everybody covered uh, the, the, uh, the, the violence that the Muslim Brotherhood members and pro uh, former president, uh, uh, the violence that was witnessed in Cairo, in Rabah Square. But nobody, almost nobody, and when it was covered, it was very slimly covered in very few articles. The uh, burning and torching of uh, more than 64 churches and many more faith-based institutions, Christian faith-based institutions, for no other reason than the fact that these citizens and the followers of Christianity were seen as the enemy of Islam and the greatest political opponent of uh, President Morsi. Um, so even though citizens, these citizens were not involved in any physical assaults on the Muslim Brotherhood, um, they became the subject, the object of an extremely uh, 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 p persistent and systematic form of, of revenge, which has taken extremely violent forms and which continues to this day. Um, I think the most important one also happens to be the societal, which never gets covered in the media, but this is the kind of encroachments that we see on a daily basis. Um, the pressure on women to cover up, and it becomes not just a question of dress mos modestly, it becomes a case of you are a prostitute, you are sexually promiscuous, you are not uh, a good woman, simply because you are not uh, dressed in the same way, you don't have your head covered. Now, some would say, yes, but Muslims who are not veiled are also subject to the same kinds of attacks. Absolutely. But there is an added element to this. So Muslims, they would say, you are mutabarrija, which is a term that you are immodest. But for Christians, you're not only immodest, you are a member of an, inf you are a, you're an infidel, and you are uh, somebody who is against Islam. So there is a religious dimension to it as well. I think that the witch hunt culture that comes from the increasing encroachment on Christians as being seen as um, enemies of Islam. So in cases where there ha where social, and there was a high level of social cohesion in many Middle Eastern contexts, social cohesion is under pressure. And as communities uh, pull apart, Christians then become um, accused of defaming Islam. And in many cases, there is no evidence that they have defamed Islam, that they have said anything. But it's just the perpetuation of rumors, and people go with these rumors because they have grown, they have grown apart, and therefore they become vulnerable to all kinds of rumors. And again, we see these patterns not just in the Middle East, but in Pakistan and other places, as we will hear in, um, today in the, uh, tomorrow in the Asia panel. Of course, what, what makes the media sometimes is the, the attacks on the places of worship, people going to worship and being massacred while uh, in church. Again, this is a, is a pattern that continues to this day. Uh, the other issue, and I think this is the most dangerous, and I think this is the one, if I could uh, ring extreme alarm bells, this would be the one, which is the collective punishment of Christians if one individual is seen to have erred. And this is very dangerous because you can protect places of worship, but you cannot prevent communities from not responding to this idea that if, if, if you and I ha uh, uh, have a, a, a simple fight over the price of cucumber or the price of zucchini in a marketplace, um, because I'm a, a Muslim and you're a Christian, I then call upon all the Muslims to come and say this Christian has, has wrongly done me, and then all the Christian houses become subject to burning and looting and attack. And this is the most dangerous because this is spontaneous, you can't uh, account for it, and it becomes a case where we have seen a persistent increase. The quantitative data I have undertaken in Egypt shows that this has been the kind of uh, cause or trigger of violence the most in all cases. And it is very dangerous because it says that there is an increasing sense of intolerance among people who have lived 
together for thousands of years, literally thousands of years. Finally, I th I'm going to skip legal discrimination because of time. We can come back to it in the, in the, um, the discussion time. But I want to move into the economic predatory targeting because that is not covered at all. And this has been one of the prime causes of the fact that the uh, population of Iraq has gone down from uh, 1.5 million at the time uh, when Saddam Hussein was uh, removed from power to now anything between 500 million to 800,000. So, you know, almost half the, pop half the Christian population in Iraq has disappeared um, from the Middle East. Um, so there has been a pattern that we have seen in many communities where Christians exist, whether in the Middle East but also beyond, of kidnapping for ransoms. Uh, when it started happening in Egypt after the Egyptian Revolution 2011, um, one of uh, my Iraqi friends said, ha, 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 you know, it's, it's starting in Egypt as well. This, oh, they must have taken it from Iraq. This is where uh, we've been seeing it. And of course, the ha, ha, ha bit was not, she wasn't joking. She was she was uh, mournful of the fact that this is something that we are seeing across as a pattern. Um, also the occupation of private property, the economic boycott of Christian-owned businesses, which does not get reported, but which has been happening at a substantial level in Egypt recently and in, in some in other parts of the Middle East. Um, also, I think the, 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 the idea of that Christians are a fair booty um, that, that it's okay to, if you take over the property, if, if, if you take over the land, that's okay because there are infidels. And again, this is a very serious pattern that we are seeing increasingly happening, not just in Egypt, but elsewhere. The situation in Egypt has more, most, more recently, since the second revolution, improved, but these patterns continue. And um, we're not getting to, to, to look at them enough. And it's not just, again, in the Middle East, although these are most, of the, most of these actions uh, are happening as a pattern most clearly in the Middle East. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> One of the things that uh, Maurice obviously is, uh, is very passionate about and is something I'm passionate about is the lack of the media coverage of these issues. And you brought up some theories of why. And I'm interested to hear from all of you of why you think the Western media has not covered these issues, especially because um, if you think of, uh, now a lot of people say, oh, well, because they're liberal. But of course, everything you're describing is anti-liberal. So, so it should fit into the category of issues that they care about. Not, you know, terrible to women, terrible to gay people, oppressive. Um, why do you think there just doesn't seem to be that much interest, considering that it's such a large scale problem? Hey, I think, um if I could plug an earlier book of mine, uh, came out uh, about four years ago, uh, dealing with religion and journalism generally. Uh, the book is called Blind Spot, which gives you an idea of the theme. The subtitle, When Journalists Don't Get Religion. Um, one reason the, the theme of religious persecution generally, and here particularly about the persecution of Christians, is not covered or not covered well is that religion itself isn't. Mm -hmm. uh, very many journalists have a secular mindset and again secular can mean many things including good things. Um, but the idea that religion is um, simply a matter of emotion or tradition, it does not really shape human beings. That What is understood to, shape, to drive human beings is money, sex and power. But faith is not included. Um, so when you see something overtly religious, uh, there's a great tendency, I generalize obviously, uh, among many journalists think, what's the real reason? What, what's going on behind this? So there's a tendency to miss religion, so you miss religious persecution. Um, when you're dealing particularly with Christians, and again I generalize, but I think this is, is true in much of Western Europe, uh, North America, Australasia, uh, the image, still a very dated image of who Christians are, mm -hmm. and they're understood to be uh, white Western males. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you know, the knowledge that Christianity is probably the world, third world's largest religion, uh, Todd is much better than this than me, but of the ten largest Christian communities in the world, only two, the United States and Germany, are in the West. But there's this image, we are, Christians are the Western colonialists. Mm -hmm. And um, so, means you might not notice them elsewhere, 
Um, or if there's persecution, you think it's an anti-colonial reaction. So I think those are at least some of the reasons. Hmm. Interesting. What do you think? Well, um, I, I think it's, it's a problem of awareness at almost every level of what goes on in the rest of the world. I had a friend from Vanuatu who was coming to the United States, and, and when he got to Los Angeles, they said, well, where are you from? He said, Vanuatu, and they said, well, that's not a, pla that's not a country. So they, they uh, detained him and took him into this uh, office and they and it took for a long time. Finally, somebody came in and there was a great big world map and they said, show us on this map where your country is. And he went over to the map and his country wasn't there. So you can see, I mean, it's, it, it's, a, it's a very difficult thing, um, you know, to be from somewhere else. And I, I think it's, uh, I wouldn't just point at journalists. I, I, I think many of you have, have seen recent research showing in the behavioral sciences that almost all the money is spent on weird people. Weird being Western, educated, industrialized, rich, from democracies. So often what we get, even, even in the academy, does not really take into account the whole world. And I think that's a fundamental problem that has to be overcome. Yeah. Um, Reese also was talking about demography, and that's sort of your area of expertise. I'm wondering if you could just get into a little, um, you know, information about how globally that has affected the persecution of Christians. So um, again, if you're living in the 20th century, you know, um, communism and fasc fascism are your main uh, enemies. Um, half of all uh, the Orthodox community in 1970 was living under communism. So, I mean, this, that, that's, that's a huge, a, a huge proportion of your community, and, and that's the, uh, you know, the story for the 20th century. The 21st century, it's, it's much more diffuse, and um, 44 of the 46 countries in, in Paul's taxonomy are in the Global South. And uh, so, so there's really a, a, a fantastic shift um, in where this is all happening. And as I said earlier, this, these are the places where uh, you have the fastest growing communities. And they're, I mean, if you take a country like Nigeria, and especially, of course, in the northern part, who is it among the Christians that's being persecuted or killed? It could be Catholic or Anglican. It could be... Af uh, African independent churches like the Redeemed Church of God it could be Presbyterian or Methodist. So, but the fact is that it's in the global south. It's in it's in a place where um, persecution is on the rise and Christianity is on the rise at the same time. So I think that's the um, correlation that I wanted to point out. Right, that's interesting. Um, and Maritz, you touched on this a little bit, but I think it's important to sort of expand on what happens when Christians leave these countries? You know, how does that impact the society? Um, and even how does that impact Western countries in terms of having relationships with those societies? Mm -hmm. I think I'd like to start by saying that, sorry, um, when we talk about re religious diversity, what is at stake is not just uh, Christians living mm -hmm. in their homes that they have, they've had for over 2,000 years. We're talking here about very ancient communities and uh, this afternoon we will hear more about what does it mean to have that heritage going extinct in the region for, for, for the peoples who have lived there for, for a long time in terms of the cultural uh, and spiritual dimensions. But what I would like to actually say is that the, when, um, when there are encroachments and attacks on Christians and they leave, the diversity that is at risk is for the majority Muslim people. Because what we have seen in recent decades with the rise of totalitarian uh, political ideologies that happen to be associated with radical Islamists, and they're not the only ones, we have totalitarian ideologies that happen to have their ideological base from other ideologies, but I'm talking here about the Middle East, it just happens to be that radical Islamist political parties and movements have been at the heart of trying to reduce the diversity in the, in the Middle East, homogenize it. And those that have suffered are not just the Christians. So in Tunisia, one of the most religiously 
free countries in the Middle East. Suddenly, after the revolution, with the rise of the Salafis, they have started attacking the shrines of the Sufis, a very peaceful and spiritually oriented, um, um, just normal Muslim believers, but who happen to have a spiritual, a, a sort of a, a way of practicing their Islam that is accepted in Sunni Islam, but the Salafis see it as a deviation from Islam. So they have suddenly become the subject of attacks. In, um, in Egypt, where again we have had the Baha'i community, which don't see themselves as Muslim, and they see themselves as a distinct religious identity. Um, they have been suddenly the subject of increasing attacks by, uh, by the uh, Muslim Brotherhood and by uh, the Salafis. Uh, a few days before the Egyptian revolution of the 30th of June 2011, we had what I would describe a pogrom mm -hmm. against a group of Shias in Egypt. Now, Shias, again, have lived in Egypt for, for decades. Nobody you know, they just happen to be Muslims of a different denomination. Um, the Muslim Brotherhood and Salafi leaders mobilized the community in a very small village in which I used to work as a development practitioner many years ago. It's a very, there was a very high level of social cohesion. Um, they attacked the house and they burned the people in it. Uh, three people were burned to death. So what I'm saying is that the, the, when you homogenize, when you start to exclude on the basis of religion, Christians become your primary target because they happen to be the largest uh, Christian minority in, in, in the Middle East, but everybody suffers when there is a, um, a, um, an absence or a taking away of diversity. Sufis, Shias, um, what have you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Paul, you wrote in your paper, one of the major factors in contemporary persecution of Christians is the association of Christianity with freedom and pluralism, and I'm just wondering if you could expand on that a little bit. Okay. The, um, I think uh, certainly the, the uh, vast majority of Christian uh, churches uh, now hold in their uh, official documents uh, a commitment to religious freedom and also as part of that of the equality of uh, religious groups and people before the law. So not only perhaps the freedom to do certain things but also civic equality which uh, puts an extra layer on that. Um, this also means that uh, com combined with the stress on the, uh, the independence or the, the autonomy of the Christian church to govern its own affairs and of Christian believers and all other believers as well, uh, to be able to live out your life in society, that is not just worship but to um, to run hospitals, uh, uh, social organizations, uh, schools, universities, magazines, newspapers, media, and so forth. That is to ex express your faith in society. Uh, this means that uh, Christianity is a major, it, it itself is plural, and a major source of plural, pluralism, meaning diverse centers of authority and practice throughout society. That's now inbuilt. Uh, as I say, many Christians may not be aware of it, but it's intuitive. It's in the DNA. It's part of the structure of our belief. So whenever you're getting a setting, communism is the most obvious one, or to uh, actually, um, you know, the totalitarianism is the idea that there is no such thing as privacy, anything sealed off from the state. Communism is, is a, the clearest example. But with the post-communist authoritarian states, similarly, if you get a religious nationalism, uh, such as you're seeing to some degree now appearing in Burma, but you have in uh, India with, with radical Hindu movements, um, the idea that uh, there must be, in the case of India, a Hindu hegemony, or in Burma, Buddhist hegemony, and um, other groupings should not have influence. So it, it's use an abstract word, these are monistic, and similarly with radical Islam. There is one order, there is one structure of authority. Um, all bodies are subject to that central authority. So any movement, and they're very widespread, which holds to that view, finds that uh, Christianity is, is a problem. Hmm. Uh, you know, putting it um, in you know, God and Caesar terms, Christianity, Christianity necessarily holds that Caesar is not God. 
And uh, to quote the late Samuel Huntington, uh, the communists say uh, Caesar is God, and radical Islamists say God is Caesar. Uh, with Christianity, it's a challenge to both of those ideas. Um, Todd, one of the, um, something you hear about a lot is how in China, Christianity is growing so quickly despite the fact that they're so persecuted and some people would even say because they're so persecuted. Um, why do you think that um, it's, it's flourishing in China under persecution but then you see in the Middle East people you know, literally fleeing the countries? Is it a different kind of persecution or is it that they can't leave China or what's the difference? Yes, it, it reminds me of a, of a little anecdote in our own work. Um, there was a wealthy group of uh, industrialists and business people who wanted to see if they could make uh, evangelization go faster, so they invited uh, my co colleague David Barrett to speak on uh, evangelization. And uh, they asked him, uh, Dr. Barrett, could you tell us what the most effective means of evangelization is in the whole world? And unfortunate for them, uh, we were in the midst of a huge study on Christian martyrdom. So uh, he said, I think it might be Christian martyrdom. <laughs> and there was a, a long silence in the room. Uh, and finally, one of them uh, screwed up the courage and raised his hand and said, Dr. Barrett, could you tell us the second most effective means of evangelism? <laughs> so one of the things that uh, that we have not seen is any correlation between, you know, precise correlation between persecution and church growth. And it is just as you say, in some places, it's remarkable what happens in other places. Um, Christianity is extinguished or nearly extinguished. And so um, I think we're gonna hear more details about China at this conference from an expert. So yeah. I would defer to him, but I think that's one thing to be careful about in looking at this is trying to uh, put a one-size-fits-all uh, interpretation. So, And I've also, uh, sometimes you hear Christians or people say, well, you're Christian, you sh you're going to be persecuted. The Bible says you're going to be persecuted. I mean, how would you respond to that? Well, um, well, I think demographically speaking, which is the only way I should really speak here, um, it's, it's just, it's been significant throughout the entire history, history of Christianity. And I, I think it should be surprising to us that we're in the modern age that we're still grappling with this. Mm -hmm. and as I said, you know, people maybe 150 years ago thought that this would all change, you know, with the sort of inevitable progress. And, and yet it, we, we seem to be constantly coming back to it. Uh, and I think theologically speaking, we heard that it is part of the Christian experience, and demographically speaking, it seems to be persistent as well. Mm, interesting. Um, so, Maurice, your paper is fascinating on everything that's going on um, in uh, the Middle East. The, in particular, though, you take on some of the what you call the myths about cops, um, and I'm wondering if you could. I, I know there's no way you can get into all of them, but if you could just address the idea that there's a lot of misunderstanding about the cops. I think the one I'd like to. The one I'd very much like to touch on first now in terms of what is happening in, in the Middle East is that, yes, people are leaving, uh, sometimes pressed by circumstances, sometimes um, in search of a better life, but there's also a tremendous amount of resistance. And uh, one of the myths that we have lived with for many years in the Middle East is Christians are, um, ha have diminished rights because they don't call for these rights, they don't demand these rights because they have uh, not being active in public life, a bit on this idea of persecution that this is, mm -hmm. this is the cross they're supposed to bear, this is how they act and therefore they deserve what they get. Mm -hmm. Well, not deserve, but this is how it almost goes. Um, I think one of the things that we have seen is a tremendous amount of political activism by Christians uh, in Egypt, for example, uh, where they have been active not just for the demand for equal citizenship, for people who belong to the Christian faith, but for the liberation of the entire society. A very recent example of that is uh, we have been working in Egypt on, or those that are in Egypt have been working on coming up with a new constitution that will be put up for referendum next month. Um, Christian Coptic movements uh, were in there with the, in the hearing committees of those that were devising the constitution, and they said, we insist that absolute religious, absolute rights 
uh, religious freedom be not just delegated to Christians and Jews, but to all non-Muslims. And they asked that the term in the article be changed from Christians and Jews to all non-Muslims in order to be able to recognize the rights of all. So that's one myth that has been very much propagated. Um, the second myth that I'd like to, uh, to talk about, which touches on what you said, is, oh, well, these were all the, the outcome, these um, Christians in the Middle East were all um, 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 the, the, the products, if you like, this is the term that is often used in Arabic, of uh, colonialism. Um, what is often missed out is that these Christian communities were there since, for the last 2,000 years. These are very ancient Christian communities. Um, the third myth is that these Christians are far better off economically and therefore any kind of discrimination they are subject to, which is often a Marxist lens on this, it's, it's a class war, it's a class struggle, that they are better off and therefore they become the objects of economic spite and so forth. And I would say that because Christians in these communities have been there for thousands of years, just like everyone else, they come from all classes. And in many cases, they are uh, subject to economic exclusion more so than others. Uh, in Iraq, this has become a particularly uh, acute problem. Um, sometimes economic discrimination intersects with gender. So if you are a poor Coptic Christian woman, you are going to be subject to much more ex economic exclusion than if you are a poor Muslim woman in most cases. So that's the second myth. The final myth that I will go for is the, um, is the idea that uh, it's, it's their practices, it's, it's their being so open and public about their faith that gets them into trouble. Uh, and I, and I think that discourse is, is one of these issues to do with the myth that they are trying to evangelize, they're trying to be aggressive, and, and therefore they're getting it. But I think that the daily practices that I was talking about, you know, just, just not being uncovered in many cases, becomes enough to be seen as you are deviating from what is seen as the norm. Uh, but I'd like to emphasize the idea of resistance. There's a great deal of resistance, and it's not just Coptic Christian movements, but I think what we saw in Egypt more recently and many parts of the Middle East is this idea of Christian Muslim solidarity against ideologies that are seen to be encroaching on public space. Um, and that I think is a very important sign of the fact that it's not just about demanding your rights, it's about people coming together and saying, no, we reject ideologies that do that to us. Thank you. So I think we have about 15 minutes to take some questions. Um, does anybody have a question out there? Raise your hand, do you wanna go right there? Um, this is a question for Maris Tadros. Hello. Um, so you've worked very closely with uh, Muslims on the ground, so at the grassroots level. Um, and so my question to you is, um, what do these people who are suffering persecution, what do they want from us in the West? What do they expect from us? I'm asking that coming from my own background. I've been working with Alex Miller uh, in Israel-Palestine. And one of the phenomena that we've noticed there is there's often in public discourse a form of self-censorship in which Christians will say there are actually no, no, there are no problems. Relationships are great, um, and also there's evidence that especially those with positions of power will try to hinder public discourse about Christians. In other words, these Christians often feel uncomfortable when their minority status is made very public and discussed in these kinds of contexts. For example, here right now, because um, that might actually lead to a, um, a degeneration of their situation. Um, what do they want from us? What do they expect? And what could we do? Um, I think the first thing uh, I'd like to, to start with is um, I think there has been a great deal of disappointment um, with the way in which uh, Western foreign policy that has supported the Muslim Brotherhood has turned a complete blind eye to, uh, um, to human rights violations perpetrated by these regimes and which were not covered. In many cases, that didn't just include Christians, but uh, uh, women's rights violations. And um, the discourse was, well, give them time. Any transition is, is going to take time. And it was this, again, just like before the ousting of Mubarak, uh, people refused to see the reality on the ground, which was that people were on the brink of revolting. There were constant protests. And people said, we don't want to see this. You know, um, they, they, they feel that there is, again, this perpetuation of a Western disconnect. We don't want to see things that don't fit into our foreign policy 
interests. So I think that was the first thing. The second thing um, I think is, is the, uh, what, we, what they do expect from the West is uh, do not apply double standards when you look at human rights violations. Um, do not take into account the human rights violations of the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, but then ignore the human rights violations against the Christians because you don't want to seem Islamophobic. Um, the third issue that I think is very important is to support and endorse uh, local production of research so that Christians do not become the objects of Western uh, scholarship, but give them, help them build the research capacity and human rights monitoring capacity so that they can come up and their, their voices are conveyed to the West. This is what's happening on the ground. The third thing I think is the issue of dissemination and coverage because often um, there is an attempt to, to convey to the West what is happening, um, but there isn't an interest. So I think creating the space and finding the way in which to create the space is very important. Finally, very, very quickly, um, this is very controversial and I'm not saying we're struggling with it in terms of as a policy issue because it's a double-edged sword. Um, but in many cases, and we saw this with the Mandians, for example, and other religious minorities in the Middle East, is that when they applied for asylum on religious grounds, uh, there was no recognition that uh, religious persecution was happening. Um, so I think the fact that governments in the West need to recognize there is a problem and, and that people are often the subject. doesn't mean every single person who applies has been subject to religious persecution, but to recognize that there are contexts in which this has become an issue and therefore to consider their application seriously. In many cases, for example, in the UK, um, uh, it's seen, uh, I remember looking at cases where they were saying, President Morsi has said that he believes in equal citizenship, therefore your, uh, you know, people that, that they were applying, therefore your application for grounds of religious discrimination are unfounded. So it is a double-edged sword because in Iraq, for example, now there are voices in Iraq who are saying, don't give asylum, we need these people to stay here, this is their land, this is their place, they've been here for thousands of years, we, can't, we don't want to lose them. Um, it's, it's a problem, but I think it's a policy issue that also needs to, to be addressed. Thank you for that question. Um, I think that, that it's important just to take note of the fact that there are still some Christians who don't believe in pluralism in the world, and a lot of uh, Christians, for instance, in Russia, see pluralism as, in fact, equivalent to relativism. I was there lecturing a few weeks ago, and I found somewhat to my dismay that the Russian Orthodox Church is quite happy in their words to leave issues of security to the state. That means keeping out foreign influences. That means not registering churches such as the Methodist Church, which is seen as American and South Korean, even though it was English in origin. And uh, actually, then, uh, it means that Christians uh, for many of the reasons that we've seen this morning, for questions of national identity, for instance, are themselves persecuting fellow Christians. Yeah, uh, thanks, Roger, for um, emphasizing that point. The, you know, the formulation I used was the majority of Christian churches now uh, confessionally hold to a pluralistic view. Uh, not all of them. In, in, the, in the category I used, the sort of uh, of post-communist states. Um, you often get a strong identification of the church that could be usually Eastern Orthodox, sometimes Oriental Orthodox, um, you know, with the state. So you get that to some degree in Russia, one sees it in Georgia, um, Armenia, and uh, elsewhere. So, but I'll just take it as a salutary reminder that the patterns I point to are again not universal. Good morning. Um, my name is Julia, Julia Bicknell. Um, I've heard a lot of people say the media are not, have not covered these things. And I want to um, speak as someone who's worked for over 30 years at the BBC, mainly in the BBC World Service and BBC World Television. And so I could be one of those people you'd like to accuse and say we haven't done enough. Um, it's something I've lived with all my working life. Um, and like um, Kirsten, I've become very interested in this topic. The difficulty, as you know, for any journalist is verification. Mm. And um, I left the BBC last summer in order to spend my entire working life focusing on this topic of Christians, I prefer to say under pressure for their faith around the world, because I think we're all pr under pressure. 
um, whether we live in London as I do or Washington or, or, or Central African Republic. Um, but how do we actually deal with this? Because Marie's is, is you know, quite critical, as she rightly should be, about the lack of coverage of the churches being attacked in Christian communities. But the difficulty for someone like me uh, was to verify anything because it was often villages that were cut off by police roadblocks and that kind of thing. And even the sources within those villages didn't get any information out. Now, you can't really blame the media if the information is not flowing to us. So I don't know whether the panel has any practical suggestions uh, as to how we can begin to solve this issue, but it seems that I don't think the media can be entirely uh, to blame for this. I just want to second what you're saying. I, I recently experienced this with Syria uh, because I was getting a lot of reports from people saying there were pogroms going on and there was really no way for me to verify it and I can't write about it unless someone can verify it. And to a certain extent, I think that, and I'd love to hear what you guys think about this, I don't think the human rights groups do a not, the, the not, like the human rights watch of the world, not the Christian human rights group probably dedicate enough resources to this um, and so you can't really find out what's going on in the way you might if another group was being persecuted. So I, I definitely hear what you're saying, um, but I want to hear what, what you all have to say. Yeah, I'm actually, I think there's a lot of power in politics there because I remember I was interviewed by BBC Radio and, um, you know, they, and it was an hour interview in which they asked me what I was going to say and then um, two hours before we were supposed to go live, they told me, actually, we've changed our mind. And then I had a, an inf I had a friend in there, and they told me, Maurice, they didn't like what you were going to say. Mm -hmm. So I think there is, there is not just a question of verification. There is a question of deliberate omission, uh, which is, I'm not saying it's in all cases, but it does happen, and we have to look at why is that. The second issue in terms of verification um, is the, the fact that we do need more local think tanks and human rights organizations based in the country uh, because they're able to, I've, I was often able to get into villages um, uh, as a local person which I knew uh, the police and the security people would stop others who are foreign correspondents. And, um, so I think if there's one thing that can be, that would make a difference. But then I think there's this issue also of dealing with the power hierarchies that come with that. Because sometimes you have some excellent material coming out from local human rights organizations. And because they don't have the international logo, they're not seen as, uh, you know, as of sufficient prestige. Uh, and so they're questioned. It's almost very racist that, mm -hmm. you know, local human rights activists uh, are not as good or not as able to. So we also have to deal with the, the global power relations of racism, of omission, um, and start by uh, countering that, by giving those people voices and legitimacy. Um, in many cases, I actually had original documents. You know, I had a document, for example, from a police officer in Upper Egypt, where he says, due to the collective targeting of our Christian brothers in so-and-so village uh, by uh, uh, thugs uh, and their taking over of their property. So this is a police officer. This is an official police statement. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I just also want to say there's a lot of laziness um, uh, during with the, what was going on in Egypt with the Muslim Brotherhood. By talking to people who were knowledgeable, I was able to find a bunch of local human rights groups who weren't even Christians that were condemning the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, you could go to the Muslim Brotherhood Facebook page and find, see them inciting violence against the cops, and yet this never makes it into any of the coverage. The, the, instead, they have the Muslim Brotherhood spokesperson, but they're not actually talking to the locals. So I do think there's a lot of laziness. But If I may, too. Uh, Julia, I'm not in a position to give you any advice because you're the journalist and I'm not. Um, but the, um, as you know, when you're dealing with, with a story, you have to react very quickly. That's not the time to get your background because it's got to be done in two hours. So it's what you do beforehand. But, and I would just say for journalists in general, I've been doing seminars on this around the world, of being, a, being aware beforehand of the religious dynamics. So it's not this new thing which just comes out of the blue. And with that then, being aware beforehand of sources you might use, as, as we mentioned, but just taking the Egyptian examples of, for, from August 14 through 16, um, and good examples of media coverage. 
uh, two people were putting out so real-time information then was the Maspero Youth Union mm -hmm. and then the Egyptian Initiative for Personal Rights, uh, both very good organizations. What the New York Times did was reprinted the Maspero Youth Union listing of 103 yeah, attacks. Yeah, did the same. <laughs> and, yeah, and saying, and what they were saying was basically, we can't vouch for each of these individual attacks, but this is a pretty good organization, and here's their summary. Mm -hmm. So I think that was one way of getting at it immediately, but it's basically, you know, taking religion and sources seriously beforehand, so you're not surprised when it happens. Yeah, no, I thank you. And Paul, you know I've worked on the same network of journalists yep. around the world to develop this religious um, understanding and intelligence. Uh, thank you. Okay. Right there, sir. My name is Robert McCulloch, and I'd like to... Um, put my question to Maurice Tadros, an observation more than anything, and just invite a comment. Uh, it's specifically, Maurice, when you were speaking about um, your proposal or in, um, suggestion that uh, in uh, Muslim countries in particular, that uh, special electorates, are, or perhaps as they were called in Pakistan, separate electorates should be established to ensure that uh, non-Muslims would have a representation in both the federal and uh, provincial assemblies. Um, in Pakistan, this was actually introduced by the dictator Ziyar ul Haq as a means of exclusion and separating Christians and Hindus and Buddhists, people who weren't Muslims, on the grounds that they shouldn't have uh, a role in electing people who would be the majority uh, decision makers in parliaments. Uh, it was Pervez Musharraf who abolished the separate electorates uh, from the point of view of uh, asserting that um, Christians and Buddhists and Mus uh, are as much part of the political reality of Pakistan uh, as anyone else, according to the founder of, uh, of Pakistan, Muhammad Ali Jinnah. To me, it seems from the Pakistan experience that to assert again the need for a special electorate, even though there are some reserve seats in Pakistan, specifically for Christians and Hindus, but everyone votes in the, the general electorate. The danger is that you reinforce the majority mi minority mentality, Aksriyat Akliyat, and it's really going to uh, perpetrate, uh, uh, um, perpetuate um, these, this process of exclusion and um, homogenization of society mm -hmm. about which uh, some of the other speakers have been, spe uh, have been mentioning. Mm -hmm. I'd to, uh, do you have a comment on that? Yes. Well, thank you for, for this. I think it's just a, a very, very quick clarification. I didn't say special electorates, I said quotas, affirmative action. And affirmative action can happen in different ways. Uh, just we've learned a great deal from um, uh, the enforcement of affirmative action on for women, where the introduction of women of quotas, affirmative action for women, did not increase hostilities between men and women. Um, but the, uh, and I would I don't think in most cases in the Middle East you can have special electorates because Christians do not live in communities that are geographically separate from Muslims. Lebanon is an exception, but in most cases, Christians are dispersed everywhere. So it's not going to be even geographically possible, and I wouldn't recommend it. But when, when I talk about quotas, I think we have to come to terms with the fact that because there, there has been an increasing pressure, um, uh, social pressure from the bottom up, not, not just top down, um, with the Islamization of society to reject having Christians in positions of leadership, um, there has to be some kind of complementary measure to be able to create the space. So the affirmative action can happen by, for example, parties saying that out of uh, the, our proportional list, we will have at least 10% Christians um, within the first uh, uh, 10 people on the list. It can happen by uh, 
delegating a number of seats in parliament uh, for Christians, uh, they would still have to go through the same process of nominating themselves for office in Christians and Muslims, uh, putting them forward. But it's just that acknowledging that the level of uh, social non-acceptance of Christians means that they don't have the same equal chance. I wouldn't ever go for uh, separate electoral uh, districts because obviously that would, I agree with you, entrench religious um, um, uh, separatism, which is not ideal for any society. It's not what we aspire for. Um, can I just end on the note of recently in Egypt, in the constitution, this was being debated. Uh, Ten years ago, I was a, fir a firm opponent of the introduction of any affirmative action for Christians in Egypt. And I even, as a, when I used to work as a journalist, I wrote articles saying this is a very bad idea because it will entrench the idea of religious mediated identities. But I think today, with the situation in which it is almost impossible if you are running as a Christian man or woman in a majority Muslim electoral district for you to come to power, there needs to be something to recognize that it's not fair ground. So what happened actually is that in the local councils, in the current proposed constitution, they said we will allocate 20% of the seats for the youth, we will allocate 25% of the seats for uh, women, and we will allocate an acceptable percentage for Christians as will be decided by the law. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop on that note. <laughs> Okay, we have time for a very brief question and a very brief answer, so <laughs> yes, there you thank, go. Thank you, Kirsten, you mentioned Syrian. Uh, that's a very naughty issue on the one hand. Could you, you lean know, a little more into your, oh, I'm sorry, sorry certainly. You, yeah. you, you mentioned Syria, and this kind of follows up on something Riz just said. Syria, of course, is particularly naughty. On the one hand, you have uh, Bashir Assad, who was a ruthless authoritarian uh, who gassed children, but also protected religious minorities. Over against him, you've got the Free Syrian Army, which seems to respect the rights of religious minorities, but is not faring well, uh, as opposed to what Jamaat al-Nusra is doing. What is your sense, what is the panel's sense of what the, not only what is the most desirable outcome, uh, will, will there be ultimately enclaves that are set up there, or is there some reasonable hope for some kind of a settlement and some kind of social reintegration among the different faiths there? Yeah. Well, I'll let you, you, both of you answer. I mean, my understanding is that it's not going to, that the, the people who might take over from Assad are probably going to be worse for Christians, um, but I don't, I'm interested to know what you think. Yeah. Um, in, in terms of the, the Christian community, obviously you can't do a polling of them, uh, and we're going to have people later in the conference who are, you know, on the ground there, so I'd want to defer to them. Uh, but. Uh, the Syrian Christians I talk to are more worried about the opposition than about Assad, particularly of groups such as al-Nusra and so on, but they've now got the upper hand in, in the opposition. Um, what, in terms of what Western countries um, should do, I would like to see um, a lot more stress on humanitarian means, humanitarian corridors, things of this kind. That's difficult, but I have not seen much effort in that also dealing with the refugees out of country, Turkey, Lebanon, Jordan, and so on. So some strategies for us. In terms of um, you know, what it would be the best outcome, I'm not sure if it's realizable. If you can, in, I, I think um, Assad is not going to go without a fight because he'll be dead. And you know, as a generalization in, in such settings, I'm, I am, I don't believe fiat justitia periat mundis, that you know, uh, let justice be done and the world perish. I'm willing to let dictators go in peace if they'll go, rather than have another 100,000 lives in order that they face what they deserve. So in terms of Assad, I think, um, can you have some sort of ceasefire, which is important, which may leave him in place, uh, but under different conditions, and I think um, whether you like it or not, you're going to get enclaves in Syria because nobody's going to trust anybody anymore. Mm -hmm. So you'll have Alawite areas, Druze areas, and so on. I think that would be the best achievable outcome, but I would want to defer to people who come later in the conference. Okay. Well, obviously we could talk all day, but we are out of time, so thank you very much to our panelists.